Damn! Oh, uh, uh, <laughs> welcome to a, another episode of How to Control Your Temper. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, that's not true. It's, uh, what I was going to say was, as, as a lot of you know who watch, uh, I want to say good evening. I am Rabbi O'Herlihy, along with the Navarro brothers, and we are proud again to be able here in the closing moments to offer the evening vespers as we close out another fine day of Fine programming here on your cable st Oh, yeah, and we would like to thank, she just left, uh, the Midnight Dometrix, or whatever she calls herself, and <laughs> an another great another great cable show, and, oh, yeah, she wanted me, she forgot, she wanted me to be sure and give credit that the chains and whips are courtesy of Big Isle Security. <laughs> so here, here in Oklahoma City, Oh, and Big Al, Big Al Security, where their motto is, we don't have a motto because it's locked up in the safe and we can't get in. We don't know what it is. <laughs> Trying to get on with the car routes and the playing of the national anthem and the midnight vespers and all that. I thought, first, before we all try to get into the car routes, since it was brought up to play a little more go figure because uh, we're all sitting ducks, speaking on your behalf. <laughs> For the kinds of messages, the kinds of things that life just generally makes available, and several of them I kind of brought up as examples, and it's tied in, I think it's time that we can use them again, it's tied in to some of the things Kyrie's been talking about, it's simply about how life is going on in certain ways. Life whispers, life waves, life says all sorts of things, and people just stand there, as they're supposed to, or else life would really be ticked off, probably. Surprised. And people don't notice. Several of things that Kairut's brought up, just, since we don't have much time, I don't have to go to a lot of trouble trying to hint and wink that they might be connected to the Kairut's. Because uh, as per the third from the last Cairo tonight of the viewer who said that first he found all this fascinating, but then life being what it is, and he referred to his brother, began to watch it. And his brother you know, pointed out that there's nothing to be fascinated about, and you're making a mistake. The guy pointed out life and everything being what it is, that even though he deeply regretted it, he didn't know what else to do other than now have to agree with his brother and life. So I'm sure you see how the connection is laid now irretrievably deep within the still hot asphalt, and we'll roll on. Two things come to mind. I saw that line from a Baptist preacher. So I, I like to give credit. It's always find interesting that ministers and priests and rabbis of any sort, or even politicians, would say, well, that brings to mind so-and-so. I don't know. Some of us are easily tickled than others, I guess. But at any rate, there's several things. One is weather forecasting. Well, I knew all of you were expecting that. Uh, besides the scientific... I guess anti-Mia Cooper's explanations as to why they cannot forecast the weather, and they can certainly explain why it can't be done. And it can't, with humans knowing what they know, and the size, the universal being a more apt description of the weather, then local minds will never be able to absolutely forecast it. It's all they can do. They're lucky they hit it you know, 30 minutes from now. They got all the satellites and they got all these computers, but you know, the guy at the TV station, if he's got any sense at all, what the best they can do is run outside. You know, if he's high up in a building and look, and if things look all right here in the United States, if he looks off to the west and it looks pretty clear and it's not raining right now, it's to run back inside and say, things look very good for the next, oh, either six days or 30 minutes. <laughs> But they will admit it's the point. You've got to understand we're not picking on them. And 
uh, I, there are managers of TV stations, let's use them since they're big on the weather and they devote, when you say a newscast, wherever you live, they will have an hour news show, they will surely devote easily six, seven minutes of the actual airtime to the weatherman, you know, chitting and chatting with him and him talking and pointing to maps and showing all the, but I can assure you that there are station managers, just reasonable guys that got to a place in ordinary life fairly successful that will point out or discuss amongst themselves or with you if you were non-aggressive that in times past, a few years back, a decade ago, that some of the stations considered even striking the weather out and just let the newsman, which they start out doing before you guys' times in the early days of TV and radio, but they just how whoever was reading the news just looked down you know, the newspaper, whoever was, you know, or called the weather bureau in Washington when they only had one spot, and they just read out what it is, that the forecast is, the prediction is, there'll be rain tomorrow, and uh, you know, so be prepared. And that was the weather. Some of the people, as I started to say, that those even involved said that they had decided at one time that it was even detrimental to the apparent integrity of the news program to turn around and devote a large segment of a guy coming out there dressed up and they were used to flash, you know, they had a doctor's degree in meteorology from Stanford and do all of this and the guy say, well, and tomorrow it will be doing so and so, it will be sunny and it will be 65 and you get tomorrow morning and it rains for the next 48 hours and it's freezing. And this goes on consistently. It's, we're not attacking. you got to follow this now. And I'm using the station manager, just trying to get you to see how life dances with itself via man. That they would say that they seriously at one time thought it would even be more intelligent. That some of them, it had crossed some minds, there were some ideas for plans for them in some local market, some particular market, to announce we are, you know, station so and so, channel so and so, our news show, we have decided, we want to announce it, I am the manager, or they have the anchor person do it, we have decided we are going to delete the so-called weather portion of the show. We're going to have one of the anchor people will read just a very succinct one sentence <laughs> forecast from the National Weather Bureau. We're selling all of our satellite equipment, all that, <laughs> and we will really miss, you know, Freddie Barnes here who has been doing the weather. You know, he did a great job, Freddie. He's got a job out in Phoenix, so he's not going hungry. <laughs> but we've decided, as all of you should know, that people can't forecast the weather. He knows it. He went to school. You can't do it. It's just 30 minutes. You're lucky if you can say it 30. So it just seems ridiculous for us to do that. But then they thought, these have station managers, and you should be doing this already for life. <laughs> then they thought, well, wait a minute. Nobody writes a station. Nobody ever complains. <laughs> this weather man is one of our heroes. If we, you know, we have autograph signing day at the mall, he gets as much attention as anybody else. And they think, what in God's name is going on? Do we announce the guy? And here he is. He's dressed up. You know, he's photogenic. Had his nose job. Gets his hair done. Got a degree. And he couldn't predict. I can walk outside. There's the whole thing about cows can do it. There's farmers all the time. This used to pop up. But some guy would, you know, out in Iowa would figure out. He would write somebody at the New York Times and say, I figured out I got a cow that, you know, if it, if it makes rude noises and those kind of body odors in a certain way, I'll know it's going to rain tomorrow, and if she doesn't, it won't, and I've been keeping track, and sure enough, the cow seems to predict the weather better than the guy who works for the New York Times. So, the station manager, see, we're speaking for all of life, the station manager thinks, well, wait a minute, we all know, including him, that he, nobody, he can't predict the weather, a cow can do as good as this guy can, and there he stands. How come the man is not reviled? How come he's not hated worse than a dentist? I mean, how come he's not the laughing stock? How come we're not the laughing stock? How come I'm thinking about, how come I'm worried about the integrity, the intellectual integrity of our news team when they're up here doing serious news stories and trying to report factual, provable information and this guy comes out and says, well, tomorrow, without any doubt, you'll be glad to know when they all chat, it's going to be sunny and warm. And by the time it gets off, it is thundering and lightning so bad you can hear it into the, through the station walls. <laughs> and he thinks, what's going on here? This information, this so-called information that we are seriously presenting is a farce. How come the 
nobody complains. <laughs> huh? And we, what new people have been hit? We've been talking about the secondary world, seriousness, hobbies, foolishness, the difference or the lack thereof, or the connection between entertainment and information. You don't remember the Kai Root that pointed out that you won't like something unless you will, and you won't believe something unless you like who said it. There's no connection between that and people being able to stand up a weatherman. So at least you think we're picking on a weatherman. How about this? Let's see. Instead of a weatherman, how about just for instance, how about the Pope? How about your rabbi? How about your mama? No offense. How about everybody in the world that says, well, I'll tell you what's going to happen. Please do, Papa. Please do. Father so-and-so, priest, tell me what's going to happen. All right, when you die, you're either going to heaven or it will be sunny and warm for the next 48 hours. <laughs> Because from one serious view, rather than just picking on weathermen now, from one serious, ordinary view, if you're just intellectual, at the ordinary level, not anti-religious, not real aggressive, you'll just take, let's jump from weather to religion, and think, how is it that I and the rest of the world throughout history has set still, not for just popes and rabbis, but people sitting out in villages 5,000 years ago, and one of the guys that they grew up with wanders off for a while, and you know, God knows what he did. We don't want to talk about it, but he wanders out of the village, and a couple of years later, he comes back looking a little, a little different than he did when he left, let's say. <laughs> and he comes back, and he's wearing, you know, a buffalo skull on his head, <laughs> and he's wrapped branches around here. And rather than, which you look back and you think, well, they should all gone. God damn, the man is the original crazy person. Rather than that, he comes in and says, oh, oh, and he says he's got a message from the gods. And it all got started. And you look back and think, how come they didn't laugh the man out of town? Or how come they didn't, you know, say, get away from me? You know, you're crazier than a weather forecaster, even though before they knew what it was. But they didn't. Because now the mind tells you that there is a difference. There is a need for serious information. If that's true, how do you explain the fact that you sit there and you will turn on the TV? You could be an atheist, but you don't get wet. So I hear and you'll turn on the TV, and you'll, you'll wait, and you'll say, shh, shh, and you'll keep an ear out if you don't listen to the rest of the news to hear what the weather forecast is, and you're an idiot. I mean, you've got to know that, or either that you've got the world's worst memory. How about that? You don't remember that you can flip a coin. That's a lot better. That's even safer than a cow. Just flip a coin. Is it going to rain tomorrow or not? Heads or tails? That's it. The difference between, if there is any, between entertainment and information, what makes a secondary world go around, and... What validity, if any, I'm not saying, I'm just bringing up, it's not up to me, I'm like a philosopher. It's not up to me to furnish I like this. The answer is, I can only bring up the questions. <laughs> <laughs> what connection, if any, is there between entertainment and what seems to be information? Serious information, not just the weather, but what happens after you die? What's the purpose in life? I don't know. That's Freddie Barnes here, the old great weather man. The third other three minutes, I wanted to say one more thing. Uh, this brings up, it combines two, count them two, flavors in one. It was the Navarro brothers that used to always be trying to sleep with twins. <laughs> Except them being the Navarro brothers, it wasn't that they just tried to sleep with twins. What they wanted was to sleep with two sets of twins. So. <laughs> One time lately, I brought up for another reason. If you recall, I brought up, without just mentioning names is not the point, but there was a beautiful example that we have a well-known uh, politician, man in high office, that uh, has been reputed and by observations that you could make just seeing him watching your own TV set, man in a very high position that seems to have the IQ of not yet dried asphalt. <laughs> and is in a very high position in city affairs. For another reason, I was using him as an example, and him still not being the point, of course, but as another example that not only had that happened beginning, I guess, now four years ago, more or less, but now there had become, after that, like an aftermarket 
wherein people were discussing, books were being written, reputations attempted to be made over debating, now, is he actually that stupid? And I was pointing out for another reason that don't worry about somebody that stupid. What you should worry about, not one person, even if in a high position, but the general level of intelligence of everybody, that there is a discussion over, is he that stupid? You know, don't worry about him. Worry about that, you know, half the population is going, well, I don't know. You know that, there's your word. All right, that's to bring you up to speed. Now we've got 60 seconds. Now I want to ask you. Now everybody knows what we're talking about, I assume. We recall. Now, I brought that for one reason, but now let's expand it. How about into the great world of conspiracies? Now think about, even though he's not the point, all of you I assume know who I'm talking about. It could be in, their, in other countries they got people like this. But assume, <laughs> think about, let's assume that this guy is as stupid, just intellectually as dense, an accidental low rider out on the streets, out in the neural streets. Accidentally, just his shocks are gone if you ever had any. <laughs> I right, assume, assume that, you know, let's assume that all of you agreed, well, he is. Think about this. Then, then ask yourself right quick this kind of question. Now, follow me because we're not talking about individuals. That's not the point. And we're not talking about the kind of literal conspiracies that pea brains worry about. And were you still rang at all? All right. He got there. He was selected by somebody. It, it, it took some doing for him to get where he is. Then ask, well, how in the world did that happen? What well, could be the purpose? I mean, just accidentally, people are, the machinery of life is such that how could an imbecile end up in a big position? Assume that, that let's uh, just assume up to this point that he is just an idiot. Now back to conspiracies. Then ask yourself, wait a minute, that's not possible. An imbecile, really, if a man anywhere even, if he was twice, if he was ten times as intelligent as he seems, he'd still be too stupid to be in an important position. Something is wrong. How about this? What if he's not? What if he's not even anywhere close to stupid? What if it's part of the conspiracy to periodically run somebody like that up in the public consciousness so that the idiots, no offense, I mean, you, you can identify yourself, that the rest of the imbeciles can laugh at him and think, Jesus Christ, we got imbeciles. <laughs> we got idiots like that in positions of authority. Ha, 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 ha. <laughs> And what if he's not even close to an imbecile? What if there are whole areas, shall we say, of imbeciles that we haven't even pointed at lately? <laughs> and it's certainly, what if it's certainly not him or those that helped him getting the power, which again you should ask, well, if he is that stupid, if he is just that much of an idiot, how in the hell, why would anybody allow it that was around? <laughs> <laughs> And leaving you with that note, we would like to, of course, lead you in prayer to close out the station. And if you don't like it, we will send over Miss Midnight with her whips and chains. And you'll kneel and pray with us whether you like it or not. <laughs> Hello, all you people on audio. Uh, all you fine people in Arizona, Clyde. Oh, you find people in California, in Oregon, Montana. Oh, and Toronto again. Welcome back, especially to Bob. And Philadelphia. To all you people full of brotherly love and, and other things I don't guess is any of our business to. <laughs> and Miami, getting tapes again down there. To hello to all you people. And somebody down there, send word. Give a call over to... Olga and Pepin and tell them I sent a hug. And we're going to try to hit some of the, I guess all of you out there on audio got, there's nowhere to go satisfactorily with a public tape on the idea of conspiracy. Uh, but I, I'm just going to assume, I keep saying that, that you guys here and in the other cities, you get something out of it because I'm not pointing or trying to get your imagination to start off with the idea of actual political and these ordinary ideas of conspiracy because I point out to you that religion is the original conspiracy theory. And all you got to do is just read the first few lines, best I can recall, of Genesis. The first part, the opening of the Koran. As soon as you point out, 
Yes, and lo, a fight broke out between goodness and badness. There you are. It is the basis of all conspiratorial theories. <laughs> but the thing is, people don't look at it that way, and that turns into crackpot area. You know, the, the people that say, well, there's a bunch of uh, communist bankers who live underground uh, and burn, and they're actually running the world. Which, again, it just shows the human mind. Forget the literal aspects of it. But it shows the human mind, again, that some guy sitting, a guy who runs a used fish store in Sand Mountain, Alabama, <laughs> comes up with this theory that he is convinced of that there is a group of communist bankers who secretly run the world. Consider, and he's, you know, he, consider how, well, shall we say a certain flaw in this, that even if it were true, well, the certain flaw being, if they're that smart, then they ain't very smart. Because they let a guy running a used fish store in Alabama catch him. <laughs> you know, and he can't, he, it, don't even, it doesn't even seem to cross his mind like, wait a minute. <laughs> even if there is a conspiracy, the one I discovered can't be it because I'm too dumb to know it. <laughs> because if I caught it, then the whole thing's over. And one more time, abandon the idea of bankers and actual people. Go back to the idea of religion. Go back to the way the human mind works. Go to the idea that there's an unconscious, unknown motivations that run man. Which is the same thing as religion. But look at that. There's the beginning of all conspiracy. And nobody notices, again, how dumb it is. Like, wait a minute. What kind of God's a God if I can conceive of him? That doesn't sound quite as funny, does it? Shows, shows some of you are probably still trying to hedge your bets in case you die and it doesn't work out. <laughs> but just... <laughs> but just for you people, how about this? There's a Cairo even a few nights ago that one guy told another guy. He said, hey, hedging your bets is just another shabby form of self-reference. I know it's nobody requested that, and there was no heavy breathing when that was read the other night, but there you are. See, it shows that hormones and me and Kairut never forget. So what was I talking about? <laughs> the conspiratory, conspiratorial theories, I just wanted to point out that the man in the high office that we're talking about is just, and may I say one more time, I am not pointing you even talking to you guys specifically in some direction, there is no end to this sentence. Well, there is, but I can't tell you what the end of the sentence is. It's not anything to originally perceive of at the ordinary level because I'm not defending now and saying the guy's not an idiot. I'm not saying he is. That's named the point. It doesn't enter into it other than the fact that at all ordinary levels, it does seem to be of some pertinence. It does seem to be real that the guy is an imbecile. And nobody has ever asked at the ordinary level in any meaningful way. Nobody has ever asked, well, wait a minute. It seems to me that the man is absolutely an imbecile in the real, well, if not a technical. I mean, they hadn't put him away. But Jesus, he is a walking colloquial example of an imbecile. But then nobody, no reporter, no critic of the administration, no one has ever said, wait a minute. How in the hell could a man who ended up being the head of this country personally select a man who's obviously an imbecile. Why in the hell would he do that? What in the world's going on? Nobody ever asked that. Never. That's not the end of a sentence. That, there's no point to that. Don't go, ha, oh, boy, what a heavy point. I never thought about that. That's nothing. Then the question is, it, once you, if, you took, if you'd ever taken that line, then you've got to say, well, it almost would make me think that he is not an imbecile. And then you've got all kinds of things like, well, wait a minute, I've spent the last four years laughing at him. Because as far as that part of my reasonable mind's concerned, the man is an imbecile. It's not open to question. But then you think, well, wait a minute, how can it be that he is obviously an imbecile, even to my precise <laughs> clinical way of thinking, and then for me to think that there is no way, there is no basis, there is no historical precedent, there is nothing in my wiring system at the best possible level just in everyday affairs that would lead me to believe that in this part of the world, in this day and time, that an imbecile would accidentally suddenly rise right at the top. You know, 
one heartbeat away, as they like to say from the top, that this is not possible. That this, if this were actually true, life would be in an uproar. I don't mean politically. Humanity, at least this part of the world, would absolutely be in some sort of uproar that, wait a minute, things are finally falling apart. That an imbecile, some way is just accidentally, life has gotten so out of hand, the intelligence of life itself, that an imbecile is almost leading us. And then you'd have to think, something is extremely strange. Then if you were really strange, you could have on your own hit what I just threw out at you a few minutes ago. What if, in spite of everything your eyes and brain would tell you, that he's not an imbecile? Then you got to think, Jesus, he is either. Then you're left with, it sounds like two to start with, but it's many more. You say, well, he is either the world's greatest actor. You know, it's a good thing that Olivier died when he did. So as to not be seen, the man is either the world's greatest actor, or, which is actually and or, but or, me, and, almost the rest of the population of the world, or at least this part of the world, are imbeciles themselves to fall for it. But then you've got all kinds of splinter possibilities after that. Like, well, what if that is true? What is the purpose? What if it was a charade and the man is anything but an imbecile? And behind that look, it might as well be somebody wearing an imbecile mask, a real good job, but you know what they can do in Hollywood. And behind that is eyes and a brain as cold as a butcher knife. And knows quite well because he's playing a part to be a high-ranking imbecile. And that a good part, at least 50% of any particular time of the people that he seems to be a figurehead, or one of them, of, at least half of them, at any time they think about him, are considering that he is a helpless, helpless imbecile. And behind it, he is not. And of course, then you got the conspiracy that comes in because he couldn't have got there alone. Some group decided it's about time to run an imbecile up the flagpole again. <laughs> Of course, then you got questions like, well, why? What's life up to? Forget things about economic, because that's always going on. That's part of the scorekeeping of life. But forget that there is some very material, basic motivation for the conspiracy. Then just ask, what if it couldn't be him alone? There would have to be a group of people decided, all right, it's time to put an imbecile way up high visibly to let the people laugh. Of course, it might if you really get good at metaphors and you don't have to call in the middle of the night an expensive neurologist to come over and try and treat it. <laughs> then you might think, wait a minute, it's a whole new version going sideways of let them eat cake. <laughs> let them have an imbecile to laugh at. We'll throw a party while the ship's going down. As Rome burns, hey, let's throw a party. They can say that, and you can imagine it's Marie trying to get her hair straightened out, realizing that they're at the Bastille door and holler, throw them out some cake, you know, distract them. Then you might think, well, wait a minute. Oh, that sounds nice, and you can even make some kind of historical, political hay out of those old stories. But wait a minute, it's getting interesting. If life itself, the original, the great conspirator, periodically runs up a highly visible, apparent leader who's an imbecile, by all appearances, so that people can think, God, what an imbecile. I thought you'd see. Well, yes, Rome is burning, but hey, tell the people we're going to throw a party and the drinks are on me. And you figure, well, people are so dumb, or at least some people, especially get them drunk, and they won't notice that he's the fucker that set the place on fire. Send them all out some cake. And Marie figures, hey, Louis, those people are so dumb, especially anybody who speaks French to start with. They're so dumb, they're not going to notice how we've been robbing them blind. All we got to throw them out some cake, and they'll think, hey, it's somebody's birthday. <laughs> what if life periodically runs out somebody and says, hey, look, here's a man in an important position. You're king, you're ruler, a high figurehead. And look, oh, take it just a second, just look, the man is a goddamn imbecile. Anybody laughs. So you're waiting for me to say, well, what's the conspiracy? Well, they look at him and laugh at being an imbecile so that they shall, how, 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 how shall I put it? <laughs> so, so that they might not look uh, <clears throat> in some other 
direction. <clears throat> Did not get too obscure. Well, Walt Kelly's dead, so I'll put it this way. I'll paraphrase one of his mythical heroes. Somebody looked and says, we have met Nero, and we are him. <laughs> All right, we'll try some car roots if that's what you feel about it. If you're going to be like that, I'm sorry I said hello to you personally. No, I'm not. There were four or five in here having to do with the pugilistic arts. I assume you saw how they were tied together, but somebody's already the first one requested. And Kairou noted, one of the neighbor's sore heads, he blames it on the sore head, told the milkman as he stopped by, quote, shadow boxing, punching bags, and using tankers, stumble bomb, spiring partners, that is. Kairou's not sure you knew what a tanker was. Stumble bomb, spiring partners, all of that was what initially gave life the idea of, hmm, let's produce man. <laughs> and of course give him somebody to laugh at <laughs> I tried to refrain but I'm actually going to weaken you know I point out I assume some of you might have gotten something metaphorically if you didn't hurt yourself out of the idea of having an imbecile to laugh at but uh May I assume rhetorically that some of you could have on your own jumped a little past laughing at somebody and having somebody to revere, like a spiritual figure, a hero, a prophet. Because if you can see with at least three or four eyes, it is the, oh, same thing. I'll go ahead and, well, at least we have somebody to revere. And a guy says at the bottom of the car, well, that's strange. My brother and I used to have somebody to laugh at. Yeah. And they looked at each other and says, would you like to dance? <laughs> Known as instant Cairo. <laughs> and we'll instantly move on. Two guys were talking, the first one said, wouldn't it really be something if there is a single great secret of life? No one said, yeah, but wouldn't it also be something if there wasn't? And they both went, yeah, and figured that about covered it. <laughs> Which... If you have no imbeciles or heroes, the bot covers it. In the normal course of urban development, said Kairut, it will eventually come to pass that the dirtier the bus, the more people will want to get on it. You know what that means. Yeah, if you're ordinary, you could try and make something crude out of it. What it means is, is that progress is rolling on. But then if you're really good, we could do our own instant coyote again and say, well, wait a minute. Then what's a revolution is going to ride? <laughs> do, 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 do. This was the one about man A and B, but you can remember that and figure it all out, right? <coughs> Two guys became casual acquaintances, man A and B, and one of them figured out that the other guy, and of course he wasn't just chitting and chatting, that when he, he was asking the kind of normal questions he was about the other guy, just socially, that the other guy, some way this first guy found out he wasn't telling the truth, he just wasn't being factual. So when he brought it up, the first guy said, oh, yeah, and he just you know, admitted and said, yeah, but you know, if you shouldn't be taking that personally or be upset, it wasn't that, it's just I kind of have my own policy that in the course of everyday events, when somebody asks me something about myself, I try my best to always not tell, to, you know, to speak the truth about it. <laughs> that was a paraphrasing, of course. <laughs> and later, if you remember, the guy thought about it and thought, that's kind of a neat thing. Maybe, maybe I should take that up, but knew that he couldn't. A man says, I would have bet somebody would ask for this one. What did you bet? Do you know what it is? I don't have to read it. A man says, hormones start spiked, then wear down. And a woman said, hours start round, then flatten out. <laughs> and almost all ordinary people who might have heard that got together and went, hey, give us a break. <laughs> Change the subject, they said. Uh, all right, here's, I know one that's a little iffy, but if you'll listen. 
It was a super condo warrior told his aide to camp. In the struggle with stupidity, no prisoners are ever taken because none exist. Now was the second part that I was sitting there listening myself and I realized, knowing the intent, that it might not have flown that well the first time around through your earballs. It goes like this, without the promise of blood, it is difficult to get those on lower floors, people that live down the basement, it is very difficult to get them interested in the whole idea of a war. But, which if you're listening metaphorically and symbolically, is fairly easy to go, ah, if the sport, if the game, if the warfare that holds no promise of real blood, it's hard to get them involved. But, and, without that same kind of potential, that is, the possibility of some blood being shed, forget those downstairs, it's hard to get those even on upper floors, higher up. It's hard to get them interested enough to even watch it. Listen to it. Consider it. Think about it. I said watch it, because they won't want to play. They won't, oh, no, no, no. But if it's going to be a warfare of the kind that they don't even want to be involved with, no, 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 no. Uh, if that it still got too sticky or tricky, I'll point out one more time. Who are or who is a large segment of sports fans? In the United States, Western Europe, the educated. That is truly symbolic and does not prove what I said. It's just a manifestation. It's a reflection of what I'm talking about. You cannot get people, and I would assume, shall I, that you know I'm not talking about ordinary warfare and I'm not even talking about philosophical debate. I'm finally referring to something that is pushing the limits of conventional thought. Revolution is thinking that if it apparently has no, there's more to it down here that I was about to do in advance, but if there appears to be no possibility of blood, that there is not really a conflict going on, that if you know, the revolution not being presented as a struggle between good and evil, between us Baptists and all you other sinners, and you atheists and infidels and people that believe in weird prophets and idiots, if there's not that which holds out the promise of blood, at least eventually, because after you die, only the Baptist will be in heaven. Everybody else will be getting their jolly well good just desserts. So if there's not that promise, you're not going to get people on lower floors interested in it. They want, they're not going to participate. And what's the point? But, you now we're still talking about ordinary city buildings, that is city people, city nervous systems. You go on up higher up the nervous system, on up the condo, and through the educated, the intellectuals. At the ordinary level, and at first you might say, "Well, they got to be a, be you know, a better possible field." If there's no promise for blood, now remember, we're not talking about them not participating; they won't even watch. That is, they won't entertain. Well, what's the point? Nobody's going to bleed if it's not me. Era's not going to be trounced. And if you point out, well, not really. Of course, not bothering to tell them the truth, like. What do you mean, era? For those of you that didn't really get the one about the, the guy that says, you mean like predestination? And the guy said, what the hell is that? All right. Without the same kind of promise of blood, it's tricky, dicey to even get those at higher levels to even watch it. Remember, not just watch it on TV, which was fit into the story of us being on cable in places. When I say watch it, they won't even think about it. They won't read about it. It just, what's the point? That those lower down won't participate and those higher up won't even think about it. They won't entertain it. Third part of this particular Kairut. Thus, noted Kairut, this is him talking now, I have just verbally laid before you again a primo example of how the two main dwellers in humanity, those at the lower level and those at the upper, would think about the revolution if they were to and could. And Kairut said, oh, all right, here's a parting picturization that I already hit. But the revolution he defined, the universe is only game that has two teams, which only has one. 
there is another follow-up to that that I didn't include, and I guess I'll do it Monday. So if you'll remember that one. It should have been included tonight, but damn, well, I wasn't expecting this kind of weather and something. Okay, I'm going to read this because it's still for what we're talking about, if you won't get hung up on the even pseudo-humorous slights at humanity, it's ordinary mental capacity. Here it goes. There's a letter that came in It says, speaking to our show in the Cairo, picking up on a term, thinking about something you've used several times recently on your show, I'd like to ask you this. What is the difference in being, quote, pea-brained and being of just ordinary mental capacities? <laughs> Those of you with some memory may recall that there was more to the page that Kyrut in essence says, hey, what he was saying is, do I have to say anything? Did you hear what just went on? And in case you do not see the connection, back to the conspiracies. Either way, that there's an imbecile in a high place here. Wait a minute, that can't be true. What if I'm the imbecile by thinking that, because that just that fits no known paradigm for the way life operates, or thinking I have caught on to the conspiracy I now know, said the man in Alabama. I now know who it is on the other side of the world, this secret group of men running things, and it never strikes him. Wait a minute. If I could find a group of little bankers hiding in a cave in Switzerland, and they were there just like I thought, and I ran in and went, aha, I caught you, and they went, Jesus, you caught us. Could that, is there any way that that's actually the group running things? I mean, because if it is, I'm smarter than they are, right? That means I'm running things. <laughs> now, I'm smarter than the conspirators, which, of course, does not work that way, because if it did, and everything still being equal and not being equal, and this occurring, a man would give a whole new definition to soiling your clothes. <laughs> if he thought, wait a minute, I've caught the conspirators, the people secretly running the world, that means that I'm smarter than they are, and that means, God, I don't want to think about it. <laughs> and which, of course, they don't have to. That's part of the purpose, again, of guides and faraway conspirators is that you never have to think about it because you're never going to be able, you or anyone else at the ordinary level, to get hold of God, to get hold of the truth, the conspirators, because if you did, then you would be left with, wait a minute, if I caught them, and, I, and now there's no doubt, it's not theory, I caught the sons of bitches, that means I smarted them, which means, you know, I'd be God. Well, of course, not that, I'm just being crude. That's not, that's, they ain't having meaning, but it means I am. I'm the smartest man alive. <laughs> no, no. no. People would be pounding on the bus. Let me back in. No. No, no I repent. No, I recant. I, I just thought I knew what was going on, but now that I realize if I do know what's going on, that means that there's no one in the world that knows as much as me, and this is it. No, 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 I, re I repent. Where can I get hold of some redone pills? How can I get my brain re -sown? How can I go back? And of course, that's never your problem because nobody ever goes that far. Uh, okay. That was really all that was requested, but I will leave us off on this fine weekend by reading the last one. Ex parte. Unilaterally requested by moi. It's the last page, and here we go. In fact, it starts out saying this is the last page, being a letter from another letter from a viewer. A few nights ago, something was read on your show, which I understood, which I heard to say, and then he quotes it, and Kairut said, you know, that was the paper that he remembers, and Kairut said, hey, could I have made all this up? And the viewer says, my question then is this, made all of what up? <laughs> I 
All you people out there in the other cities, tell yourself hi, give yourself a hug. And you should do something. I ask you again about getting some fresh bodies in these other cities because those of you that are still, shall we say, sincerely interested it could be adverse to your own best interest if any of you people getting a less body showing up. I'm not trying to be threatening, but it could be not in your best interest. But other than that, write if you get work.